Emergency Matters, the RF and Microwave Update. I'm Pat Hindle and I'm here with my co-host Gary LaRude. It is our 100th episode and we're here at AutoLive in Lowell, Massachusetts. They're a manufacturer of safety systems for OEMs around the world. And I'm here with Roxy Payne, the Director of Autonomous Transportation Ecosystems at Analog Devices. Also Alan Jenkins, Director of Technology at AutoLive. So we're going to talk a little bit about autonomous systems and especially focus on the radar sensor. And we hear a lot of talk today in the news about autonomy and advanced safety systems. Uh, so what are some of the main uh, challenges that we still face today on the sensor technology? Well, I think one of the major ones is actually the environment. So we start looking at certain conditions, whether it be fog, rain, snow, sleet. Um, we especially get the snow and sleet here in New England. It's one of those things where all different sensing modalities have different strengths and weaknesses depending on the environment. So when you look at things like radar, radar is you know, fantastic for detecting you know, objects and such through snow and rain, where something like LIDAR, maybe still has some challenges. So there's pros and cons but depending on the different uh, sensing modalities that are still being worked on and the environment is still a really big piece of making sure that we have uh, the proper sensor technology in place for all weather conditions to make a fully autonomous vehicle. On a uh, more mundane plane I would say is that um, cost and size and power dissipation is very important. Radar historically has been used for autonomy in various ways for the military. Missiles are autonomous. In the commercial world, aircraft are fairly autonomous and that's mostly radar based. But of course there the, the form factors are very different, which sets the aperture on the radar, which uh, talks to how large the sensor can be and still operate inside the vehicle. And then there's the, uh, the, the dollars that you can spend not only on the RF, of course we see economies of scale driving those down today, but on the signal processing that you need to extract every piece of information from the radar return that you get. Because we have large amounts of signal processing in a sensor today, our current production sensors run at 300 megabits per second internal data rate. That requires a lot of signal processing and you have to remove that heat from something the size of a deck of cards. So there's very, very significant design engineering challenges and innovation that has to happen to make it affordable for autonomy for people. So I think we understand that for full autonomy you need a suite of sensors. Radar, LIDAR, say camera technology. Can you talk a little bit about how all that data is fused and used? I have an interesting analogy about fusion actually. We all have senses as human beings. You can hear, you can see, you can smell, you can touch and you have more than one sense. Right, and the reason you have more than one sense is um, evolution. Over millions of years, you've learned to survive and not be eaten by something big and menacing that you can't see or you can't hear because you can smell it. So it's a survival technique. And autonomy is the same thing. It's about survival. It's about being able to operate in a complex environment where you don't necessarily have reliability for one sensor alone. The root of your question really is that um, when you look at the data rates involved in the sensors today, fusion can happen at different levels within the vehicle. It can happen at the object level, where you just see a simple representation of the world around you. Then in the radar world, the next level down is detections, and the next level down after that is the range Doppler map, and the next level down after that is in fact the raw ADC data. Um, if you talk to AI experts or machine learning experts, they want to work at the ADC level, because by the time you've gone back up the signal processing chain to the simple tracked object view of the world, you've thrown a lot of information away. Today that's done for absolute practical reasons because fusion's expensive so you need very large processes to do it and also because of history to a certain extent because of bus communication systems in the vehicle are quite conservative because they don't change very quickly and they're not enabled to transmit today anyway in production vehicles that large amount of data around. So just to add a little bit to that, 100% agree Alan with your statements around having at least three different sensing modalities um, on the vehicle for full autonomy, you know looking at radar, LIDAR and cameras to kind of give the car its sense of sight um, as you put it and then also you know hearing is also very valuable to have microphones outside of the vehicle and I think the other most important piece too is to actually give the car its sense of feeling or you know when you drive and you're going too fast around a corner you actually start to feel it and that's actually why you slow down or you don't take the corner as sharply and so I think it's really important to make sure you have all of those sensors and sensing modalities on the vehicle in order to um, have the most precise real-time map around the car and also have a better understanding of the environment around the vehicle. At Analog Devices we call that Drive 360. That's our philosophy that we use internally within the company. Exactly as Alan was saying in terms of the sensor fusion aspect of things there's an awful lot of data 
that is available for an autonomous vehicle. As Alan mentioned, you know, a lot of the people doing artificial intelligence want to have the data coming right off of ADC for radar. And that is until they learn that that data rate coming off of our A to D is three to six gigabits per second if you really want the true raw data. And then they go, well, wait a minute, that's an awful lot of data here. Is there other ways that we can look at this and actually get raw information rather than raw data at the ADC level? And that's something that's still being worked on today in terms of what the proper FFT is in terms of processing that's most valuable for artificial intelligence. There's also schools of thought, as Alan mentioned, in terms of having a centralized GPU processing unit versus doing some processing at the sensor nodes, whether that be radar, LIDAR, or cameras. And then to what level do you do that processing at the node versus centralized? But currently, at least for first generation concept cars, a lot of people are leaning more towards doing centralized processing just for the learning aspects before realizing how can we make the system more efficient by moving some of that processing to the edge. So you refer to the massive amount of data that will be collected by all these sensors. Um, so what is really the end game that we can get to to be able to process and analyze and handle all that data? To be honest with you, the verdict is still out on that. There's still a lot of ongoing research and people looking at it in terms of figuring out how to optimize it for the exact same reasons that Alan mentioned earlier in terms of cost, power, and performance, and really to, and also functional safety, redundancy, operating to be operationally safe. Those are all very, very, very important things. I mean, there's still a lot of work to be done in that area. I'd say today that the path is not completely clear. There are lots of different ways to solve the problem. And it's a very big cost performance trade-off also, ought to live. We're interested in the safety aspects of it. So you quite rightly brought up the thing that we hadn't talked about before, which was the functional safety and safety aspects of driving. So redundancy, not just between sensor types, but within sensors and the communication part is also very, very important. And also redundancy of the decision about what the vehicle is going to do is an important one. And these things are still very much in flux, I would say, at the moment. Is there an end point? I'm sure there is. Do we know what it is? I don't have a crystal ball, but it's a pretty exciting place to be at the moment yeah. for that reason, I think. So most of our viewers are interested in the RF space. So let's talk a little bit more about the radar. What is the direction the radar development is going and what are the challenges that uh, you're facing? Simple answer is more and more of everything really. If I look at the history of automotive radar, certainly we started out at 24 gigahertz. Some of it was lower than that originally. Now we've seen a, a general move up higher in frequency to 77 gigahertz. You've seen um, frequency regulation in Japan, Europe, um, and now in the US at uh, 79 gigahertz, which is like a four gigahertz bandwidth allocation. And there's now um, a discussion about 120 gigahertz. So you see higher bandwidths available, and that's necessary for the complex clutter environments that these autonomous vehicles have to survive in. For uh, you know, a, a military radar, you have vast differences between the velocities of objects you want to see, and they're very far away. But if you think about a child walking around a parking lot, that's a very low RCS target wandering around in amongst clutter that's much brighter than it is and you have to be able to see it in a reliable way. So resolving it in angles difficult. Angle resolution is always difficult for a radar because you need aperture unless you're doing something synthetic which is possible and we see um, modern radars today do employ um, synthetic aperture techniques which many years ago used to be the purvey of the military. So you see this progression of the techniques, very similar techniques, into automotive radar. And it's all about improving the three basic pieces of resolution that you have in a radar. It's the distance resolution, the velocity or speed resolution, the angle resolution. On a radar perspective, synthetic aperture, as I said before, we see advanced waveform techniques that allow us to move towards very fine Doppler resolution. Back to my analogy of a small child in a cluttered environment, that's one of the very few ways that you can distinguish that object. But being able to observe that over a long period of time coherently, and then also maybe to reconstruct with history the, the detections from an object that are related uh, to, to give a view of that object, which speaks to an imaging radar. And we see discussion about imaging radar, which again is a historically it's been a military thing but we see that same direction happening today. Just to expand a little bit more on that I think the imaging radar aspect of things are very interesting as we talked about earlier in terms of needing the three different sensing modalities of camera, radar and LIDAR. You know one of the challenges that radar has when you compare it to cameras and, and LIDAR is its angular resolution as Alan mentioned it's typically not as good but what is really interesting with imaging radar there are certain techniques that people are starting to explore typically in the startup community where we can actually enhance that angular resolution to 
a point where on radar that it is below one degree. And so that's really exciting in terms of how that will complement cameras and LIDAR in the future. And also coming up with a very cost optimized system solution for an autonomous vehicle. Today, LIDAR is still very expensive. And there's some massive challenges that LIDAR will have to overcome to become more cost competitive, where having an imaging radar could be you know, very encouraging for, to enable this market. There's you know, certain material, synthetic materials um, with meta materials that can be used to make active antennas. That's one technique for you know, creating an imaging radar. There are other techniques as well. And I think you know, we're going to see a lot more on the imaging radar front over the next uh, coming years. And now for the fun part of the episode, we're going to take a ride in this vehicle behind us, outfitted with various sensors. We're going to see how the data is collected, how it's analyzed, and how that information is fed back into the design.